everyone, and uh, welcome to our talk uh, about securing open source uh, through threat modeling. Uh, my name is Daniel Prisman. I'm a principal researcher at the Prisma Cloud uh, Core Research Team at Palo Alto Networks. And I specialize at low level reverse engineering, exploitation, exploitation and such. And uh, also I like driving, hiking, that's my ND Miata uh, at the track. Uh, Aviv. All right, and I'm Aviv. As you can see, I'm a proud dog owner. Uh, this is Lizzie over there. Um, I'm the research team lead at Prisma Cloud WAS at Palo Alto Networks. Um, so my job is basically, the team job is to create some new detections and make some uh, great accuracy results for our uh, WAS products. And I'm specializing in vulnerability research in the cloud ecosystem. Um, so I'm working with Kubernetes, Docker, Rancin, just cloud vendors and everything that um, is in the ecosystem. Okay, so uh, let's go over uh, real quick over the agenda. Uh, we'll start uh, uh, about threat modeling. What is it? Why to use it? Why you should care? Uh, we'll go over to ac how, act how actually to start uh, with threat modeling. We'll go over to uh, supply chain attacks. What is it? Few examples, why it's important. Um, then we'll provide some possible mitigations in the terms of automatic tools, pros and cons, what they are good for, what, they are, what, they are, what their problems are. And then we'll go over to conclusion to sum, to sum this talk. And this talk might be a little bit all over the place for some people. That's because uh, there are a lot of topics that we think are important when, we, when you, one start with threat modeling and we try to touch a little bit about everything. So we are going to, take, to talk a little about many different uh, topics. Uh, we hope we, you will leave this talk uh, knowing something new and you will enjoy. All right, let's make, let me grab this one. Okay, we got it. So let's start with what is threat modeling? And basically threat modeling is a structural approach uh, of identifying and prioritizing potential threats to a system. Um, so basically, if I'm a vulnerability researcher and I'm trying to find vulnerabilities in some applications or system, uh, most chances that I'll use threat model. If I'm a nation who tries to hack into some uh, other nation, I use threat model. Uh, if I'm a white hat, which uh, that's why we're here today, I will use threat modeling in order to find threats in my application so I could fix it before a black hat will find this and exploit it. So uh, this is threat modeling, and this method could be applied by basically anyone with a sense uh, of coding. It could be engineers, it could be architects, of course, security experts, um, but basically anyone could start uh, to do so. And in this talk, we'll try to give you um, the, the basics for threat modeling that, so that you could go home later and start to do it yourself in order to secure your organization, your community, um, your code base, your applications, your deployments, and just everything. So um, that's the main point for threat modeling. And the next question would be, why should we do threat modeling? Because it takes so much time and you need to uh, gain some knowledge on the way. And you know, we're also, we all, so busy and like this is another task that we need to do so maybe we shouldn't do it um, but as you can see in the recent year uh, i just give you some examples of five vulnerabilities remote code execution vulnerabilities uh, i guess some of you know all of them and i, I bet most of you know log for share <laughs> and they all of those vulnerabilities just allow attackers to compromise servers just exploit it and do whatever they want they could manipulate your data using uh, those vulnerabilities. They could crash your applications and just do everything they want. So I don't want to pinpoint um, to anyone, but if, if someone would have threat model, those uh, libraries that use, uh, that, are, that has those vulnerabilities, then they would have found those vulnerabilities, fixed them earlier, and then there wouldn't be so much impact as those vulnerability had in the recent year. 
So that's why you were basically here. Okay, uh, let's start with uh, threat modeling uh, 101. And the way I see it, threat modeling have some levels. And the first thing I want to touch is that the fact that security isn't obvious. Now, personally, me as someone who started uh, in reverse engineering, I always cared a lot about uh, security, even before I coded anything. Uh, but over the years, I realized many people, even, mo even say most developers, don't really care about security. They don't, they don't think about it. They just, uh, they, they, their code is efficient, it looks good, it's readable, um, and that's enough for them. And I actually did a, a small survey before, before this talk with many of my friends whom are developers, not in the security field, and most of them said just that. Dude, my code is, my code is efficient, it works, it has almost no bugs, it's readable. Like, I don't, I don't care about, about security, I don't think about it. So the way I see it, uh, it, the beginner level is just knowledge and awareness. Don't actually do security, just be aware that your code, your code could be vulnerable, some will m might try to exploit it. And know just the basic of security, like the basic vulnerabilities, stuff like that, I will, I will get into details in a minute. Then you have the next level, intermediate, uh, where you maybe you use some external uh, external uh, resources like pen testers or other security experts to externally check uh, check your code, and then you have the advanced, where you 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 have either in house or you hire externally security security researchers that will manually uh, review your code. So let's start uh, with details about uh, threat modeling in the beginner level. And like I said, I think, I think the most important thing is just be aware that the code you write could be vulnerable, that, uh, that it, could, it could be exploitable. And I, I, uh, I split this point into two. The first one is be aware that the external libraries you use even if your code is perfect and it has zero vulnerabilities, if you use external libraries, which most do, those can make your code vulnerable. Your code could be perfect, but if you use external code with vulnerabilities, it will make your code uh, vulnerable as well. And then there is your own code, which could maybe be vulnerable, maybe you, uh, you didn't create or, or uh, uh, ended the, the buffer properly, up and and it will make your code vulnerable. So those are two things. There is, there is the part that the code you write that you need to make sure it's uh, uh, vulner uh, vulnerability is free. And the fact you use external libraries that are up to date with n without known vulnerabilities, stuff like that. Then there is just knowledge about security concepts, uh, security uh, best, best use cases, stuff like that. Uh, use after free, buffer overflow, all the, all the basics. And after you uh, learn it a little bit, try actually pract uh, practice exploiting it. It's, it makes a huge difference uh, when you move from just knowing the concept to actually try, trying to exploit like the basic things. A few, a few CTFs, a few basic challenges. It will drastically increase awareness to those security concepts. And then there is the habit of just checking for new security issues. And I'm not just talking about uh, security issues in the code you use. If you use like a, a OpenSSL library, no, don't just check OpenSSL, but read about security issues in general. You will learn about new, new, secure, new, new security vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities, new attacks that happened, and it will increase your awareness significantly. All of those will just uh, uh, improve the idea of the code you write has, has consequences. Maybe not now, maybe not in a year, but it could be at some point be exploitable. Uh, then we go to, then we go to the, sorry about it, to the intermediate level. And like I said, it's uh, using external services like, like pen testers, uh, using external tools, tools 
that automatically search for issues, search for misconfigurations, uh, stuff like that. Maybe have in-house uh, red team that will constantly uh, look for issues in, uh, in your code. Then we have uh, the advanced level, uh, which is basically having uh, in-house security researchers. And you can see all the big companies like Apple or Microsoft, they all have those teams in, in with hundreds of security researchers that constantly tries to break the code of the, of the company. The, the idea, the logic is, we'll find their issues in-house before they are exploitable uh, outside by, by an external attacker. So you manually search uh, for vulnerabilities in the code. You use fuzzing or other advanced tool to, to, tools to search for vulnerabilities, and you regularly review the use of external, uh, of external libraries and code. All the code, all the library you use, which are uh, not developed in-house, make a habit to uh, regularly check them for, for new updates, for new vulnerability issues, for new bugs. Some, some of the times bugs will be reported, they won't be reported as a security issue, as a vulnerability, but this bug can be exploited. And attackers constantly search, search for, the, for those bugs. Maybe one of them will be exploitable. And I want to touch a little bit about uh, intimidate versus advanced. The way I see it, there is a huge difference bet, uh, between searching for new issues, searching for new zero days, um, the unknown, versus uh, exploiting known, known vulnerabilities, one days, using automatic tools to search for all the known misconfigurations, which is, to be honest, most of the attacks, or most of the attacks happens using known vulnerabilities. That's, that's one of the issues, known vulnerabilities, that all of those cases could be avoided if, the, for example, the library would get updated on time. But still, there is, there is a difference. Uh, there is a difference between uh, um, using known attacks and trying to find new things. All right, so Daniel just talked about all of the levels of threat modeling. And in this session, we would like to give you the tools to start doing it by yourself. So, uh, the following slides will be about how to practically do threat modeling. It's going to be really general and abstract, uh, but it will give you the first uh, push in order to understand how to do so. So let's start and see how can we threat modeling. And specifically, if you're developers, maintainers, maintainers architects, or um, anyone that in, is involved in some applications, I guess uh, these slides will be uh, perfect for you so you can understand that. So the first step is to set clear objectives. So we need to decide what do we want to identify as a security issue. So for example, if I'm a bank, then I guess my biggest concern will be uh, sensitive data leakage. So my objective will be to uh, find and mitigate possible sensitive data leakage uh, vulnerabilities. If I'm a real-time application, then my focus would be on a DOS or out outage or anything that could crash my application. So uh, I, that I want, I want that my clients would be uh, working in real, real time. So that's my concern. And if, as a general, uh, thumb, as a general rule, we want to also mitigate possible application takeover because this is like the holy grail. This is like the worst case and if someone takes over our application, and when I mean takeover, I mean remote code execution uh, in which the attacker get full control over the server, of, over the application, and then he would be able to uh, do anything he wants. So we need to identify the security objectives, and afterwards, we need to set a time frame for the work. Now, this one is really important because uh, in this field, you can threat model for hours, for days, or in some cases, for years. You can go so much deep and it really doesn't end. So you need to, to set a time frame for your work and to decide how deep you want to dive uh, on each project, on each threat model. 
Okay, so after we decided uh, about the objective and the uh, time frame, the next step would be to gain a deep understanding of how the application works. So if you want to find a vulnerability in something, you first need to understand how it works. And it includes how it interacts with the ecosystem can, because in many cases you can find vulnerabilities just in the interaction. It could be uh, with a database or with another server and just anything that it interacts with. And after you understand how everything works, the next step uh, would be to understand use cases and use usage scenarios in your applications. So we want to understand all of the processes within the application and ju not just the general uh, idea of how everything works. And this will be really important uh, as you will see in the next slide. And in order to ease this process, um, my best advice to you is just to use uh, existing design documents. If you have them, it could be really helpful because you don't need to uh, investigate anything. Everything is just laying over there for you uh, to use, but that's not always the case. Um, and if you don't have those design documents, there are other ways to, to make it work for you. And you know, each of us is an individual and each of us learn in a different way and understand things in a different way. So for some people reading the code of the application can work. For some creating data flows will work. For some uh, creating data schemes or just deployment diagrams. Or that, there are so many ways. Um, just pick the one for for you, we just combine some in order to understand everything and create those uh, use cases and usage scenarios. So after we got those usage scenarios, now is the time to ask what can go wrong in each scenario. And uh, for me, it's like the, the, the fun part. I don't know why, but I like it. And the way to define what could be the weaknesses, uh, usually for beginners and for uh, new to the field would be to look at some um, uh, online resources, public resources. There are so many great resources out there that could really help. And for example, we have CWE, uh, which is a community developed list of software and hardware weaknesses. It contains over 600 weaknesses types. Now, I wanna say that it includes everything, but I'm not sure. Um, this database for sure is like the closest thing uh, to cover just everything. And in the end, you will want to make a list of all of the use cases and another list uh, for, and for each use cases, you would want to enumerate the relevant weaknesses. So you would have a big list and for each use cases, use case, you will have another list. And you don't wanna go over 600 weaknesses and see if they are relevant for each use case. So I guess like the, the big tip in here is just to use uh, the list of the top 25 most common and dangerous weaknesses by CWE, it's a list that they publish every year that includes uh, the top 25. So this one uh, would include the vast majority of threats and will uh, give you the best coverage. So for example, we have out of bounds writes, we have cross-site scripting, XSS, and SQL injection. Now, there are other lists that are relevant to other applications. So for example, if you're writing a web application you can use the OWASP top 10, and this list includes the top 10 weaknesses for web application. Uh, it is maintained by OWASP. Um, and as you can see, those are the uh, 10 big ones. And if you go to their website, you can see the description for each one of them, and they have really a lot of useful information for threat moduling uh, web application. If you are uh, threat modeling OWASP API top 10, uh, sorry, if you're threat modeling API, you can use the OWASP A API top 10. So this is for APIs, API endpoints, and it is really similar to OWASP top 10, but there are a lot of different uh, differences between those lists. 
as you can see, we have a mass assignment, broken object level authorization, and on and on and on. So, um, the fourth option would be uh, Stride. Now, Stride is, is a threat module uh, for identifying security issues, but for this talk, we'll only use the weaknesses that they use. Um, it was developed by Microsoft, and the main question in Stride is what can go wrong? So, for example, if we take a, a scenario where a customer transfer his money to another uh, customer. Um, so what could go wrong? Maybe um, he would transfer it to uh, a different account. Maybe uh, a phishing attack would be happening, and like tempering. So this is like the main point for each scenario. And for beginners, I guess it's, it's a good place to start with. Uh, because it has only six categories, which are uh, really fun to use. So, after we have the big list of scenarios and the big list of weaknesses for each scenario, now is the time to see if there are any vulnerabilities in the code. Now, this is like the truly uh, research uh, work over there, and you'll need to go for each scenario, for each weakness, and just check and do your ver verification. And in this point, I guess, like, uh, you could use uh, an expert to help you for this one in, like, uh, the first time, so you'll understand how to do so. And again, anyone, everyone do it in a different way. I like just to go over the code and read it. Uh, it takes a lot of time, but I guess it brings the best results. And that's pretty much it, how to uh, threat model in general. Okay, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, supply chain attacks. Uh, as I see, this is like, this is an open source summit and supply chain attacks uh, are bound with open source projects. In my opinion, Ma many, of the, many of the supply chain attacks that happened during recent years happened on uh, on open source projects. So let's start with what is a, actually a supply chain attack. Supply chain attack is usually related to a cyber cyber attack that targets the less secured parts of uh, in the supply chains. So we can have outdated libraries, we can have uh, legacy elements code that isn't getting updated anymore. And even more extreme, we can have uh, supply chain attacks in firmware or hardware. Uh, in a, for example, uh, take security cameras SOCs. Security cameras SOCs, uh, are, it's a hardware piece. Uh, it's a hardware piece that usually and regularly gets, gets, uh, gets uh, vulnerable. People find vulnerable piece of code on, in those things all the time, but the, the development process of those things is really slow. Most security cameras use SOCs from years ago with tons of known vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities that are easy to exploit. Sometimes those vulnerabilities even have like working exploits online that one doesn't even need to know anything about coding or security. They can just download the exploit and use it. Uh, and those devices, those products are vulnerable because they are using a vulnerable part, even if they don't know that. Let's go into details about outdated libraries. Uh, attackers constantly search for devices that use uh, uh, vulnerable libraries. They are easy to exploit, servers, containers, IoT devices. This is, this is like a big one. Most IoT devices are vulnerable in some way, in one way or another. Uh, personal computers, this usually recently gets maybe slightly less popular as computers uh, are being pushed updates, even if the user doesn't to choose to update uh, himself and etc. And vulnerable libraries are almost always outdated, and I'll explain what I mean. When a when a library gets uh, gets uh, vulnerable, someone reports a vulnerability, or maybe a, a critical vulnerability is found in the wild. Usually, the maintainers update the, update the library. 
obviously there are some exceptions. A product or library can get to the point of end of life, uh, which at this point they are officially not being maintained anymore. And even that, uh, even that case has exception. Take Windows XP, for example. Uh, Microsoft uh, said Windows XP is, uh, uh, is achieved its end of life. They won't update it anymore. They won't maintain it anymore. And then uh, the eternal blue vulnerability happened. It was discovered uh, by the NSA. And it was leaked and used uh, by WannaCry. And Microsoft decided to update and patch this vulnerability despite the fact Windows XP was legacy and they said they won't update anymore. So every rule is an exception. Something very important to understand is what, you are not the target usually of, of attacks of outdated libraries. Attackers, they just search for a target. They, if it's not a targeted attack, they just search for a target. They, they, they spray and pray. They search for vulnerable targets. They will hack it. They will attack it. And maybe they will uh, hit the jackpot and this target would be vul uh, valuable. And there are also very effective tools for this task, like Shodan, which uh, if one know, uh, knows how to use it, can search for vulnerable instances online that are uh, open to the internet. So don't think, don't think uh, I don't have anything valuable in my, in my website. I'm like, maybe I'm a small, small company that uh, design website. I have 10 employees. And why would anyone want to hack me? Uh, you, you can be not a target, you can just be a target. Let's uh, give an example of uh, an outdated library, OpenSSL, widely used library. It e even has a standalone application that use uh, that library. And it is used by the majority of uh, HTTPS websites uh, online. And I give OpenSSL as an example because it's uh, uh, critical vulnerabilities are being found with OpenSSL regularly, like every few years. The recent, the last time was a few a few months ago. Uh, they announced a new critical vulnerability is found. And it's a great example because everyone uses OpenSSL. When a critical vulnerability in OpenSSL is found, it affects millions and millions of websites and the clients of those websites, so millions of people. Hardbleed, for example, is a vulnerability found in OpenSSL a few years ago. It was a high severity vulnerability uh, caused uh, information leak. It was found and reported by Google. And the CRA, which is the Canadian uh, Revenue Agency, took over six hours after the vulnerability was patched, after a fix was released, uh, to patch their servers. During that time, obviously, attackers that also read the OpenSSL uh, release statement search actively for uh, vulnerable uh, for vulnerable instances that they, they can hack instances that are late or, uh, or slow to update and hundreds of uh, uh, social insurance numbers of canadian citizens leaked because they took six hours to patch their servers and this could easily be avoided they knew beforehand and i'm not like i'm not flaming canada the, the, this could just be avoided because OpenSSL, good guy OpenSSL, even announced the announcement. They tell you a few days before they actually release the patch that they are about to release a patch. And uh, I ran a few searches before this talk, and to these days, there are almost a quarter million servers online that are still vulnerable to Hardbleed. Let's talk a little bit about legacy code. Um, I couldn't find like an accepted description of what a legacy code is, but I think most will consider legacy code to be code without test, maybe. Code that one is not comfortable of changing because maybe uh, they don't know exactly what each line of code does. Uh, code you might struggle to understand and you just use it as black box. It just works and you don't care. Um, and it will almost always be code that isn't being maintained uh, regularly or code that isn't supported anymore. And pieces of code like that is, a, is, is an absolute goldmine for attackers because 
they can, they, they, it's usually uh, uh, an old piece of code. They can actively search it for, for known attacks. Maybe this piece of code using an old library, which is known, known to be vulnerable. And there are automatic tools that you will feed them a legacy, uh, you will feed them a code and it will search for known vulnerabilities. So one doesn't even need to like be the, an expert or verse engineer or something like that and just use uh, most of the time automatic tool to, to find critical vulnerabilities in pieces of code like that. And I just said automatic tools and I want to touch about this subject a little bit. A possible solution, a possible mitigation to most of the scenarios I, I uh, described in this talk uh, are automatic tools. And it, get, it, is hard, it is hard to maintain a vulnerability free environment at scale. Maybe if you have like 10 containers, it is easy to make sure those 10 containers are vulnerability free, that you use all the latest, uh, all the latest version of all the applications you use. But it, is, it gets harder and harder if you have like hundreds of, or thousands of, uh, of, of containers or instances in your environment, in environment. But it is easy to do for automatic tools because as your environment scale, you can scale accordingly your automatic tools uh, processing power. And most attacks will happen by leveraging known vulnerabilities. The, the attacks that happen with like a critical new zero day that discovered by like some hacking group, those are the minority. Most attacks will happen uh, leveraging known vulnerabilities, known issues, known misconfigurations. And all of those could easily be avoided if the misconfiguration would fix, the known attacks would get updated, the, like the application would get updated to the, to the latest fixed version, stuff like that. And automatic tools can really help uh, in, those, uh, in those instances. They will tell you what to do. They will tell you what vulnerabilities are critical or less critical and such. And those things, those tools, they don't even need to be that clever. They could be just dummy automatic tools. Let's take, for example, common traditional antiviruses from years ago. They just, uh, they started by just comparing hashes or strings. They will compare file names or will, they will run some hashing function on the entire file and will compare it against a known database. But it was dummy but it was a very effective because back then attackers didn't obfuscate their viruses. They just created the same binary which attacked again and again. And those traditional antiviruses was, were really good against that despite, despite being not uh, very smart. Scanning used libraries for vulnerabilities. It is again uh, something that is very simple for an automatic tools to do. It will just scan all your vulnerabilities, all your libraries, sorry, in your environment and it will, it will scan online those libraries for known vulnerabilities, or for known updates that contains criti critical, abstract critical parts. Checking dangerously misconfigured components. There are best practices for components. There are benchmarks for those things. Uh, automatic tools can scan your entire environment and search for uh, heavily misconfigured components that could be uh, security issues. And the last part, it's, it's getting a bit complicated. I wouldn't call it, it's not a simple thing to do, Co but comparing pieces of code against known, uh, known vulnerable pieces of code online of open sources. So something uh, automatic tools can do is uh, break apart your piece of code, take part of it and compare it online and maybe find that uh, this piece of code is uh, associated with an open source project that was found vulnerable. I also want to touch a little bit about problems with security products because not, not all great with those. Uh, they are known to not prioritize that well. They will just, there are tools online, there are tools that uh, organizations uh, sell you that will do all the things I, I just said, and it will, uh, it will spam you with like thousands of alerts that your entire environment is, is vulnerable to so many things and you wouldn't know how to prioritize. You can't fix uh, thousands, of, uh, thousands of alerts of critical vulnerabilities. So they are not really good at prioritizing yet. I hope it will improve in the future. They have, they have false positive. They may, maybe they will alert you about a critical vulnerability, 
that isn't actually, that your environment isn't actually vulnerable to. Uh, overwhelming amount of alerts, I already touched that. And it can be hard to configure. From the moment you start using an automatic tool until the moment you're actually getting value from it, it could be a long time. Configuring uh, an automatic tools like that, a security product like that, to an environment with uh, thousands of instances, this can, uh, this can get uh, pretty hard. All right, so um, we're all gonna we all gonna go home today, and if I can give you like three things that I want you to take from here, like takeaways, um, it will be those three. So the first thing is that threat modeling is not an art, but a struct structured approach that anyone could apply. If you take the time and build your knowledge base, um, anyone can do so. And even if you do it just for a little while, you can um, find and mitigate like the, the vast majority of issues. So that's the first point. The second thing is that automatic tools could help identifying um, some of the issues, not only threat modeling, but some other things, uh, like in runtime environments and in your code. But as Daniel said, there are some, some issues with those tools. So combining both approaches could, really re could, re could result with the best outcome for you. And I hope uh, that we raise your awareness about security in this session. And if you have any questions, we'll be happy to reply. Thank you.